Firstly, I'd like to pay, uh, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet tonight, the Gallagher people of the Uor Nation, uh, and pay my respects to elders both past and present. Um, my name is Yung Ngo. I'm the State General Manager for Westpac Premium Banking. I'm also very lucky and privileged to also be uh, the chair of Westpac's Asian Leadership uh, Employee Action Group. Um, and also I'd like to welcome Dai Lee, who is the passionate and wonderful founder of the Dawn organization. Um, so you're all here tonight because, you know, you care about diversity and inclusion. Um, and, you know, this is such an important topic uh, and area across the whole Australian landscape. You know, from politics to business, um, certainly, you know, from society and, and culture. And I guess from a Westpac standpoint, you know, being Australia's first bank, um, you know, we're proud of many Australian firsts. Uh, and certainly in the area of diversity, particularly gender, we're proud of the fact that we've employed the first female bank uh, teller uh, and indeed the first female CEO. Uh, and I've got to say personally, you know, I'm really privileged and I feel very happy to work for an organisation that truly values um, the power of diversity. Um, an employee action group uh, work across Westpac is a great example of this. You know, we have eight employee action groups across Westpac group that promotes diversity uh, and inclusion. In respect of the Asian Leadership Employee Action Group, you know, we've been operating now for a bit over a year uh, and we have over 1,100 members from across all states. Um, and our purpose is really threefold. Our purpose and mission is threefold. Firstly, we want to play our part and help Westpac attract the best Asian talent possible. Secondly, we want to develop and promote Asian leadership through the many, org through the many uh, initiatives and programs which we set up. And lastly, we want to take Westpac to leadership in this space. And tonight's going to be a very good example um, of that. I'm also very proud of our relationship with um, Dawn uh, in EAG. In fact, I've met uh, Dai Lee uh, late last year. And you know, I've got to say, I think you know, when we first met, we, we, we knew we had a common passion uh, and a common purpose. And it is through this clarity of purpose that we've decided um, that, you know, we wanted to launch this five-part series and certainly in Westpac's case, um, sponsor that. So tonight's uh, conversation is titled, Will 2016 uh, Be the Year for Inclusion and Diversity? Um, to set us up, I'd like to now introduce our speakers for tonight. So firstly, I'm truly honoured to welcome Wendy McCarthy, AO, as our moderator and facilitator tonight. Wendy is the Chair of Headspace Australia's National Youth Mental Health Foundation and a Deputy Chair and Non-Executive Director of several uh, companies. So thank you, Wendy, for joining us tonight. Also, I'd like to introduce our panellists for tonight. Firstly, our very own Lynn Cobley. Lynn is the Chief Executive of Westpac Institutional Bank, as well as Westpac's International and Pacific Island Businesses. And we're very fortunate that Lynn also acts in the capacity as one of our group executive sponsors of the Asian Leadership uh, EAG. So I can't thank you enough, Lynn. Without your support, we wouldn't be doing this tonight. So I appreciate that. Uh, we're also pleased to have Kathy Munro. Kathy, welcome. Kathy is a renowned Australian Asia intercultural specialist. And Kathy is also an associate researcher at the China Studies Centre at Sydney University. Leon Doyle also joins us. Leon, welcome. Leon is a partner and head of experience design at Deloitte's. He is also the lead champion at Deloitte's for Identity, an initiative designed to celebrate cultural differences and personal heritage. So you would have probably noticed that I've just introduced their four speakers, um, but yet we've got five chairs, right? So I'm delighted to introduce the last speaker and panelist for tonight, uh, and that is you the audience. That's right, you've heard that correct, that is you. So we've got a format tonight where, whereby if at any time you have a question, you know, or you have a point of view, or you know, you really want to be part of the conversation, we encourage you to take that final chair. 
at any time and absolutely be part of that conversation. So lastly, um, for those on Twitter, we encourage you to share your thoughts on Twitter using hashtag DawnAALC. Um, and just to let you know, we'll also be filming today's um, session and conversation so that we can you know, share that and distribute that among other EAG members from the other states and also put that on Dawn's website as well. So now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Wendy and our panellists to join the stage to start our conversation. Thank you. I might sit in the centre. What I'd love you to do uh, is just fill up the seats in the front <coughs> because it's silly. I, if you're at the back, I'll pick you immediately to come down the front and get in the chair. <laughs> if you're in the front, I won't be able to see you in the same way. But it is better to just be reasonably cosy. Um, okay, how are we doing? <coughs> now, can you hear very clearly? Yes. All fine? Yes, even those people who don't want to come down to the front, you can still leave early if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I want to say, first of all, I want to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to Elders past and present, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation chose a very beautiful piece of land. And every time I walk down here, and I look at Barangaroo and I think about what a feisty woman she was and a great model for all of us, what, not, uh, what an important thing it is to remember the first people in the nation. So tonight's talk is about diversity and the question we're posing is, is it possible that we make this a year of inclusion and diversity? Now, all the people here have some claims to diversity. I just want to say there are a couple of things I think <coughs> that you might consider right now. And I think we might think about what diversity means. One thing that is really important in my life, um, is, has been in my life, is working around gender, which I've done really probably for 50 years. And during that time, I realised that and I lived in the States for some of that time. In the US, they did race first and gender came second. <coughs> We've tended to do gender first here. And race, cultural background, age, disability, all the other things that add up to the rich tapestry of people who want to come to work every day, want to contribute to their society, that they are seeking pathways to be able to be good citizens, to be responsible, to be educated. And it isn't easy. It is, if you are not the ruling paradigm, and it doesn't matter what cliches you use to describe it, in various places it's different cliches, but if, if you are not of the, the existing and ruling paradigm, you are by definition the other. And Simone de Beauvoir made that very clear when she talked about women. And it was a great surprise to her that that was the case because she thought as a writer and the, part, the partner of an eminent French philosopher that she had the world made. And then she realised that she was actually the second sex, which was the famous phrase she put together. So we all belong to some things, to some groups. But when we come to business and we come to leadership, we come to education, professions and so on, we're always looking for how we can get the best possible result by thinking about does our organisation look like the world it serves? And if it does, we have a lot of work to do with most Australian business because it doesn't look even vaguely like it. Some of this event started with Dai Lee, who's a very persistent person. <laughs> um, and whom I've been a kind of extra auntie to for quite a long time because it is the task of the senior generation to pull through people and I think people who they see talent in who are different who become the new leaders and I met Di many years ago when she worked for the ABC and had, was in the St James Ethics Leadership course 
And I could see then even a shiny person who wasn't actually going to take second best. So I'm very excited that Dawn, which is all about growing culturally diverse leadership, has been able to engage Westpac, and it was lovely Jung, for you to say those things, and Lynn, whom I've known for a very long time, to be able to engage and say, we're putting our hands up for diversity. If you put your hand up for diversity as a leading institution, there is a better than average chance that this could be the year of inclusion and diversity in Westpac. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists questions around diversity. And if you want to interrupt, or you want to sit on, I don't know where the chair is. It's down the end down there. Oh, there it is. It's <laughs> the Leon. Well, that's a hot chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do that, just put your hand up. We'll give you a microphone, and you can come and sit out here. Or if you just want to ask a question from the floor, that's fine too. So we don't really want to lecture you. We want to hear what these people have got to say, because they're people with really interesting backgrounds. <coughs> but we'd love to, you to engage in the conversation. So I'm going to start with you, Leon, because actually you're the odd one out on this floor, <laughs> this little panel at the moment. So as you're not of us, and we're the ruling paradigm right here, we'll start with you. What would you hope for if this was a year for diversity and inclusion? If I could be a bit aspirational about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, to jump ahead, I think whether we'd like it or not, it absolutely is a year of diversity and inclusion. I would like a, a diversity of ideas to be coming at us, fundamentally. A diversity of, of interactions with diverse marketplace. And most importantly to me, this is something I'm very passionate about, a diversity of talent. Because those three pillars, if you like, in my mind are absolutely intertwined. Mm -hmm. You know, we're consultants, right? And we cannot service a diverse marketplace with a diverse talent. We cannot grapple with the ambiguity of, of the problem sets that our clients throw at us without a diverse set of talent. And fundamentally, we, we want to be helping to shape um, a diverse marketplace and make it even more interesting and more diverse. And we can't be doing it without the other two pillars as well. So that's my hope for, for 2016. And I think we're already there. It's just that a lot of folks haven't actually woken up to that, to that reality. Which way? Which way is nearly there? Um, Australia. Yeah. And if I think more broadly, I do a bunch of work in the region, certainly <coughs> the region. Yeah. And I would like to think the world. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the transmission time of ideas with the internet and, and the web and everything else and social media is next to nothing now. And it is so powerful and yet so terrifying. Because now we have people whose very foundations and, and values are being challenged, right? And if we don't, as, as I, I think, you know, I'm thinking very big now, as, as, as the inhabitants of planet Earth start to grapple and learn and, and become at ease with this marketplace of ideas, um, I'm terrified about our, our future and where we'll get to. Okay. Well, Lynn, in order to get there, what might some of the changes be? Well, I think the changes need to be people very, very focused on employing the right people and engaging the right people, whether they're in you know, teams that we actually build, they're in virtual teams that we work with, to actually get that diversity of thought in, to get the, the and I think about diversity in terms of gender is one, I think about it in terms of cultural diversity, age, um, experiential diversity. Um, there are any number of different types of diversity there and every team I've ever worked with or built has been so much richer by having that diversity. And uh, so when I think about the challenges that Leon outlined, uh, part of it is the global interconnectedness of this world. So we have this very fast moving digital world, but we have a, an incredibly interconnected global world, which have taken people by surprise. I mean, part, one of the lessons, so many, many learnings from the GFC, one of the learnings for a lot of people was just how globally connected we were because we had problems that were emerging in other parts of the world. And before we knew it, the ripple effect went all over the world. Um, and um, this huge growth and the huge change in, in the economic and power base we're getting, you know, 
worldwide means that we need to understand the cultures we're dealing with. And one of the great privileges I have in my role is running the international businesses for Westpac. I love going to Asia. I'll be there again next week. Um, and learning to, to work with people of a different culture and a different mindset and how we can bring that in is fabulous, a fabulous experience. So I think um, what, uh, what we, we focus on in terms of targets, what we focus on in terms of uh, measuring uh, our success, and we, we have that. I've just come out of a talent review session where we looked at all of our talent, talent pool and we looked at it across all of those lenses. What is the percentage of women we have coming through in leadership? What is the percentage of Asian leadership we have coming through? What is the percentage? We even started talking about both younger people that were high, high potential uh, people, but actually some of the older people too. And I've had some fantastic experience over the years in, in as I say, building these teams and who've really helped me. And I'll tell a couple of stories later on when we, when we get to that uh, level. Well, Cathy, for you, why does diversity matter? Um, well, diversity is inevitable. Um, to me, diversity means uh, points of differences. So it's not about how different we are and it's all about do we know the differences, can we articulate them and how can we make use of the differences. Um, so I think for organisations and, um, and, and coming from the academic institutions, it's, it's acknowledging or embracing that diversity and know what the what which element of diversity we need for each so it's not just a general um, general terminology of saying that diversity uh, would would ensure organizations perform or better performances it's it's about the details of what the differences and what kind of differences can be used for our for each particular organization and 2016 is certainly if I say it's about time uh, that for us to embrace that that diversity and really experience the the, the earlier that we embrace that, uh, it's in very general terms, of course, um, but the the earlier we can experience the benefits. Um, I, I'm on a um, a board. I'm on the board for a residential aged care facility, and when I came on board, I was the only. Um, no, not, not, not the only female, but, but that was the youngest member, board member, and I was the only Asian person. And then I chaired a um, nomination committee that we installed of the, the organization's first female chief executive. Yeah. And so di diversity works, and it's, but it takes courage for organizations to embrace that diversity. Mm. 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 Do you think our political leaders understand the power of diversity? What? Yeah, I, I don't want anyone to, you know, to declare who they vote for or anything. <laughs> I would you want to be, you know, spare me really. Um, but it just, it just in terms of, do you think this is a conversation that is happening in any sort of sophisticated way in political leadership? I personally think it's starting to. Yep. I mean, just take a look at the numbers of, um, of, of women we now see in the federal parliament, uh, in the cabinet now. That's a big change, a very big change. One to five. Yeah, I know. It's better than, better than what it was. It was mm. one out of all of them. Yep. Um, and um, even today I saw um, wonderful, wonderful uh, treasurer that we have here in New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian. Mm. Uh, she's doing a fabulous job. So you're starting to see... Um, and embracing of people in politics, we've still got a, a, a heck of a long way to go. And I think you were going to say something yeah, else. Yeah? Um, so my name is uh, Linda Fitzharding, and I'm uh, a vice chairman and a non-executive director. And I also Can everyone here? <coughs> come out. Oh. <laughs> we got a roving mic that we could put down the front here. That would be probably best. Sorry. Um, so my, uh, my name is Linda Fitzharding. I'm, I'm a um, vice chairman. Um, and also a non-executive director, but also work for the AICD. And um, in regards to in inclusion, I think, um, and the topic about politics, I think, um, and from my accent you may get that I'm Canadian, um, I, I have to say that I've been immensely proud of the new Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, 
Mm. Um, you know, he has taken what... He's the pin-up uh, boy for the world. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, he, he has one. taken what everyone says is so <laughs> difficult and how we have to go so slowly, and it's a very complex problem, and he's just turned it on his head. He has 50% women on his, on his cabinet. He has diversity all the way through. He has, you know, the, the minister for um, uh, indigenous is an indigenous person. Mm. The, the minister for science is a scientist. I mean, you know, just really common sense things. So um, I think I'm at the point of 2016 saying, yes, diversity is happening. Mm. Um, there are people who are showing how easy it can be, and mm. we have to stop buying the answer that says it has to go slower because it doesn't. Yeah. But yeah. he's a perfect example of someone saying, this is what should happen and mm. this is what will happen. Mm. And you know what? The world didn't fall apart. Mm. In fact, it might even be flourishing in Canada. Mm. Mm. Who knows? Free education for yep. Indigenous. I mean, mm. the stuff he's doing is groundbreaking. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment about that? I mean, there's, there's not much diversity <laughs> in political leadership at the moment. There's Connie Feveranti wells who's a leader. Um, well, die, you can't resist it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can't resist that. Um, I do encourage people to jump on this chair. It's a, uh, it's a um, you know, unique feeling. Um, <laughs> I think that um, I, I, I listened to Leon, to um, um, uh, Lynn and, and Cathy, and certainly uh, the year for t um, 2016 is a year for diversity and inclusion. However, we need to make it so more because I think people are talking about it, but I think in terms of anything that's happening, not yet. And I have to acknowledge, I think, th that Jung uh, through in Westpac and Lynn, your, your the team has kind of seen having this kind of conversation to start that, to ignite the idea about leadership from among the culturally diverse staff in the particular Asian Australians to think about how you can contribute to shaping our society and our, uh, you know, our organisation. Uh, and going back to politics, yes, there is some movement there, but I can guarantee you the process to get there is still not um, as diverse <laughs> as it should be. So the number of women currently there, I doubt it at the moment in the next five to ten years we will see another crop of women to the top because it's not happening at the bottom where it should be. And so therefore this kind of um, conversation is to start people from this level, the emerging leaders, to start thinking about what's going to happen in the next five to ten years from mm. my perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that? The, the, I, I was talking to a politician who had a vision, kind of vision, um, of uh, you know, in implementing learning uh, Asian language at secondary schools. And um, so I was talking to him, and you, you know that the statistics says that the Australian, there are only 12% um, Australian parents who support their children learning a uh, second language at uh, schools. And that figure is frightening because that, that's, that's going back to 1950s. That's so lower than the 1950s. Mm. Um, so uh, as far as Australia is, is Australia's desire to di diversify, it's um, the statistics is not showing. We certainly have 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 Canada to learn from. Canada has uh, tw 20 percent. I think twenty percent of Canadian parents support their children learning second language. And it's mandatory to, to do English and French there mm. up mm. until year twelve. Mm. So. And of course, mm. once you do two, yeah. the it's third one is easy. easy. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. It was actually something I'd written down that I wanted to ask. Do you think language is a huge barrier to diversity? Lynn, you've worked the world. Mm. What do you think? I think it is in some ways. I think I think it's I think it's partly that, but also partly a non-acceptance of different cultures and different cultural norms. Um, you know, one of the the great experiences I had actually back in the early 1990s when I first met you. So we're now showing our showing our, <laughs> how long we've known each other. Um, I worked for Citibank, which is a very big global organisation and had a lot of time spent in Asia. And uh, one of the things I loved there, which was so different um, from working here, was the, the um, preferences around mealtimes. So as you would know, at lunchtime in, in Australia, people like quite often just to have a brown paper bag lunch. Sit at your desk, have a brown paper bag lunch, very antisocial, maybe read the paper, you know, still, still keep reading your emails, etc. In Asia, that's not the case at all. Everybody is out to lunch, and they're out at noodle bars, and they're out wherever it was. 
Now, I love Asian food, and I was sitting uh, working in this office uh, in Hong Kong for about five months with a couple of guys who were um, uh, American uh, running them, Citibank is running this organisation, and I just got bored to tears being anywhere near them around lunchtime, and I started going out with the, the people from the office, uh, the locals, uh, going out to their favourite noodle bars uh, and, and dim sum, etc. And I've got to say that was a tremendous breakthrough. So there was a breakthrough that came just from, besides the fact I love the food, but there was a breakthrough that came just from me accepting uh, cultural norms there. If I'd have spoken the language, it would have been that much greater. Yep. So I yep. think it is anything that shows, A, that, you know, an acceptance of being part of that culture and being part of that, um, that way of life, uh, let alone, you know, it makes it easier for us all to communicate and understand each other and, and influence each other. I, mean, I think it makes a, true, a huge difference. So the fact that we have that statistic here, and I've got to say I'm one of those people, I only know one language, um, is a bit frightening. Mm. Leon? You know, there's so much truth to watching children, and, and I absolutely agree. I think language is absolutely a barrier, especially when you're doing business, uh, to, to making diversity work, uh, you know, we're doing business in other, in other nations. But you know what? Sometimes if you give it a go, and one of the great truisms about travel is that if you try and learn a few words uh, in a different language, the people are so much more open, mm. Mm. they're so much more warm, and they're so much mm. more generous and, and forgiving. Mm. Um, I took my, my, my family to Japan, first time we'd been there um, about a, a month and a half ago now, and, and you know, had no idea of the language or the culture or anything, and kind of conducted a bit of an experiment on my voice, which was a bit mean, but I wanted to see how they'd react thrust into a situation where uh, around Japanese kids their age, and just left to their own devices. So it took them to a, to a local kind of community playground. Say, hey guys, look, there's a slide and a climbing frame. Just go. And we kind of just stepped back and watched them. And within about 20 minutes, they had made friends and they were absolutely communicating. Mm. Not in any language, though. Mm. But they were mm. absolutely communicating mm. with the other kids. And the other mm. kids were communicating back with them. Now, sure, that's not a business meeting or a conference. <laughs> But you know, as it's human, the as human, it's the beginning. And as human mm. beings, mm. we are hardwired. We are social animals. We communicate, and we're hardwired to connect with each other. And I think we can learn so much from from the young people, uh, you know, around us. Mm. I agree. I was communicating via my stomach, which yeah. I think I was talking about. But anyway, <laughs> okay, um, what you got to say? I just wanted to um, actually, and then I know some good. Tim Sim place that one, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I just wanted to um, actually ask a question around unconscious bias, really, because mm. this whole uh, conversation around languages is also fascinating. And I'll share with you a personal uh, story. So I've got three young kids, and I remember Lachlan, my middle uh, kid, he's now seven, um, but I remember a parent teacher night that we had when he was kind of like in kindy or year one. Uh, and, and the conversation went about, uh, there's certain words and so forth that he's struggling with at school, right? He's now well attuned to all that. But the comment was actually, you know, we see this a lot in, um, you know, families of, no, you know, non-English speaking background families, right? Which, which really dawned on me, right, that, you know, there's a big part of this is really unconscious bias. Um, pardon the pun to die, but it really dawned on me that this whole area and I think the importance of diversity uh, and what we are addressing really at the workplace is actually not for you know our generation you know it's actually for you know the next generation and in my case you know my kids generation if we don't take the opportunity to get this right you know whether we're talking about politics or in the workplace right it's actually for the next generation I would like some of your thoughts around that uh, so, in, in my industry, in professional services, we are well and truly standing on a burning platform. And right now, right across Deloitte and all our competitors, we are, and it might not be apparent given some of our rate cards, but we are seeing our margins erode and erode. And at some point in the future, there will be human assistive AI who can do. 80 to 90 percent of what we do today as consultants, right? And the rest is being commoditized and shifted to, to other nations with lower cost base, mm. right? And if we want to keep recruiting the top talent that we do recruit, right? These young people and these lateral hires 
demand and earn phenomenal, you know, sums of money. And at some point, there is a cross, right, between um, the cost of providing our services, right, and the fees that we earn. And, and right across our industry, we are all desperately trying to innovate. And certainly within Deloitte, we have determined that in order to survive, we have to disrupt ourselves. Otherwise, we will not have no firm to hand on to the next generation. And when we look at how we innovate, think, and how think we Andersons. Precisely, mm. right? Absolutely, mm. precisely. Mm. Um, and, and these are firms, you know, if you look at McKinsey and Bain and BCG and Deloitte mm. and Deloitte and PwC, mm. these are firms with, you know, histories that stretch back over 100 years in, in many cases, right? And we are facing annihilation. Mm -hmm. So when, when we innovate, one of the things we do very clearly is we innovate uh, with teams of people who all look and sound and come from different places. Mm. Mm. And, and so we're doing things like when we look at graduates, we're going, maybe we bring people in who haven't graduated. Mm. Because who, who knows where their life <laughs> path has taken them? Mm. Who knows why they dropped out of university? And maybe one day they, w they will. And they'll do it from a work experience base. Mm. Exactly right. Because that's why the rules permit that, for you yep. to go to university from a work experience base. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that you, don't, you, know, you just do things differently. And, and so we're very aware, we're trying to be more of, of the unconscious biases, as well as all the structural biases that limit our ability to innovate. But for us, it's survival. It's not even a nice to have. Hmm. Hmm. Who else would like to comment on that? So what we need re really is, is, while there's an unconscious bias, I think we, we, we certainly there, there's, there's a hot topic about unconscious bias. Uh, so we won't uh, highlight that, but the, fa the fact is how can we make the uh, conscious decision in improving that. Um, if, if we look at the, the, uh, the diversity, so it's not all about just that, that generalization of uh, embracing diversity, it's what are they? How can we articulate? How many people can articulate that? The fact that I actually got onto the board is because I put my hand up and I art articulated what they needed. So how many of us are going to the sh shopping and buy things just because we need it? No, that's because somebody says you need it. So I think for from uh, given that Australian, um, I just had a quick look at some of the statistics. So there are 300 ancestries in, in Australia amongst the, the population of Australia and there are 260 languages, different languages spoken, spoken languages amongst us. Um, so how much of that, how many of that, uh, yes, yes, I am including that. Um, so how many of that background are we including at, and how, how many uh, unrealised opportunities that we, 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 we don't get by not including them? Hmm. Do you want to say anything about that? No, I was looking for somebody from the floor who, who wanted to come and... I, I might just disrupt here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think unconscious bias is a pile of rubbish. <laughs> um, I think that it's conscious. Mm. I think mm. people give, it's a wimpy excuse to get away with bad behaviour, um, sloppy thinking, uh, ex excluding people. It's absolutely the opposite of inclusion. And when I was a lot younger, in the 80s, and sort of left the streets marching around women's issues to go into well, they always worked, but moving into work. We brought a woman out from America, and for one year she toured Australia talking about unconscious bias. Nobody now, everyone now wants to be a consultant in unconscious bias around diversity or something. And I just look and think to myself, we're just doing the same old thing again. Same old, same old, same old. And you know what? So some big, lumpy captain of industry says to me, Oh, but we don't have to do that stuff again, do we? We did it in the 70s. And I said, you might have thought about it for three minutes, <laughs> but you didn't actually do it. <laughs> Which I think is what you were saying, Di, and you were saying earlier, Jung, you actually have to go past indulging yourself that you've noticed someone with a completely different look is different. Well, you don't get a gold star for that. <laughs> you get a gold star for reaching out to the person, going and eating with them, talking about what their aspirations are. You might even want to know something about their family. You might like to say, you know, where do your kids go to school? And then do they, you know, there, there, are, there are millions of questions. Because 
especially when you are the parent of young children, when your aspirations are so high to be a better parent. It's one thing that when we have a baby, the first thing we think about is what a fabulous parent we want to be and how passionately we care about that child's life. Now, it can sort of fall away during life, you know, children's challenges, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that they have no chance of being different if we don't strip those biases away from ourselves. And really, we are a highly educated nation. There is absolutely no excuse. Mm -hmm. So when someone says to me, you know, people are unconsciously biased against women, I think, can't tell the difference between a man and a woman? A bit tragic if you're earning a million dollars a year. Why can't you think? Is it that you, is the bias that you've decided that some people, because of who they are, can't do some jobs? And that's the nub of it, really. Mm. Mm. If you're a woman, I remember when, when we met in City and that memorable piece of research that was done yeah. in City that said 33% of people in both qualitative and quantitative places, but the quantitative one was the most interesting, said women should not return to work after the birth of a child because basically their brains had gone to scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was so astonishing to see it there. And City was, of all places, mm. a high energy, accepting, mm. churning mm. kind of a business. Mm. And you'd think it's almost unbelievable to think people still in their hearts with the safety of a questionnaire and anonymity, and when people say what they really think, still believe, and they believe that women shouldn't be paid equally because they could never be as competent. Mm. And so we do have a lot of work to do still, and I would ask every single one of you, and I used to say this to some of the people in the city, at one level, what you do in your own private life is fine. But when you walk in, every day when you walk in through the doorway to your professional world, just say, I'm not going to be biased today. I have an open brain. Mm. And it's amazing how differently you will see the world. Mm. Because most of us think that talented people look like us. We'd be surprised to know that they don't. There are plenty of people who are not us who are talented. What do we think about quotas? Can I start that? I think I might have already put my cards on the table there. Yeah. I actually think, well, like whether it's quotas or what you call targets, I actually think targets have a role to play. I mean, I, I work in a very numeric organisation. Um, gosh, it's amazing once you, a target's put out there. All of a sudden it appears in scorecards, all of a sudden it appears in meetings, all of a sudden it gets analysed, all of a sudden the pipeline to get there gets, gets diced and spliced. And just in the same way we think about how can we grow our business serving to, you know, a certain set of customers or you know, we can grow our product franchise, etc. It's amazing. And up until that time you get a lot of platitudes, you get a lot of nice, nice to have discussions, you get a lot of, oh, well, maybe it's subconscious bias, so we, and I've had subconscious bias training. Um, maybe we were to do all of that. Um, actually, targets work pretty well. Well, in business, we do targets, don't we? Yep. We have objectives, we have targets. We reward on targets, we measure them. Why wouldn't we? What do you do? Do you have targets? We are starting to look at targets. We've spoken about quotas. That's because that intersection of supply and demand Absolutely is changing. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. We've looked at quotas. We don't think quotas are necessarily a healthy way to approach it because we think that might start to create behaviors that start to weigh other things over talent. And fundamentally, we think, end of the day, it should all be about talent. That said, people do what they're measured to do. Hmm. So an example of a target we've, we've put in, it's one plus one. When you go to a meeting, you bring someone that is different from you. When you speak at a conference that's Deloitte sponsored, you try to make sure that the people up there look different from each other. So these are the sorts of targets we're setting ourselves. And we're so proud that our new CEO, Sydney Hook, first ever female Deloitte CEO in the whole member firm, 300,000 people across the world, first female CEO. First female CEO of the big four in Australia. And it is absolutely from the top down. Mm. And Sydney's being very aggressive about targets. Mm. 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 And she's good. Mm. She's good. Mm. What do you think about targets? Mm. 
Well, I'm, I must say I'm skeptical about um, uh, how, how especially topic around diversity and to quantify that. Um, I, I think the, it's important to look at uh, different elements of, so uh, having a set target or quota, um, it, it kind of might cloud our judgment on what elements of diversity or what elements of differences we can use in, in, in an, an organisation. So um, there are, there are re researchers done that, that actually prove that the, um, the generalisation of, of diversity, just including diversity and inclusion, doesn't, um, that doesn't yield the um, better performance for organisations. So what I think we need to do is look at the, um, what the differences are and what, what area does an organisation need to uh, bring in different talents or different uh, people with different uh, either background or language or experiences or, or education level to fill the void in the organisation. Mm -hmm. Anyone in the audience want to make a comment? Yes. much easier if you face the audience. Please come out. <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly not a hot scary. chair. <laughs> yes. oh, oh, you you might, just imagine you're on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just curious about what the panel thought about tokenism. You know, when you say that, for example, at Deloitte, you've got a panel, you make sure that everyone's different. What's the difference between having a panel where people look different and actually having something that goes beyond, look, we've got the one woman, we've got the one Chinese person, we've got the one person who's wearing a headscarf. Mm -hmm. When you go beyond that, and secondly, while I am on the chair, um, if I just could also ask... Can you get used to it really? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. If there wasn't an economic imperative to actually do all these things, for example, in the case of Deloitte, not to pick on you just because you're next to me, um, you're saying that you're bringing diverse teams together in order to survive, yeah. right? If Australia was doing better financially or if it wasn't the fact that there's an entire but like middle class that's got a lot of money and we need to service those clients, which I assume you need to service, I guess my question is why, why now? If, if, if money wasn't involved, is there a moral imperative for us to actually embrace these things to do with having, you know, people of different backgrounds able to access the same opportunities as other people? I'm not sure if I communicated that very quickly, no, but like, there's a lot of... Very good question. Yes. Very beautifully. Okay. Uh, Who wants to go So first? my view yeah. is there is absolutely a moral imperative, and I think where this debate all started uh, was around the moral imperative, uh, in my view. Uh, and then where it's gone to is, as things have changed and we're talking about, you know, in a sense, the fourth industrial revolution we're going through at mm. the moment, the war for talent, uh, the fact we have a demographic where we have an ageing population, so we're getting close to the stage where more people retiring than we have coming into the workforce. So there's no doubt there's an economic imperative as well, which maybe is what's sharpening the focus where it d does end up in targets, etc. Uh, but I think the moral imperative is absolutely there and has been there for a long time. And any, look, anybody who works in diverse teams, to my mind, knows that A, it's, it's more productive, it's actually a lot more fun. Much more fun. Much more fun. And um, you, you, you just get so much better outcomes. Mm. Absolutely better. All of us will be able to quote examples of it. Much better outcomes. I'm not going to give you countless examples, but we one example when I was running Treasury over at CBA. I had a team of oh, probably about 60 odd people and all of us were pretty old at various times, but uh, 60 people. And we had a leadership team that was pretty, you know, blokey and sort of, you know, hard hitting, you know, all the trading sort of guys. And I brought in um, a woman to work with us who was an Asian woman and she held a very significant part of the part of the business and the portfolio. And um, she, she was not like that at all. She didn't drink. She didn't talk loudly like the others did. She didn't come up with all of the, the bully ho sort of tactics. Um, but gosh, when she spoke, everybody quietened down. And of course, if anybody's, uh, there's a great book to read called The Louder Stuck, The Louder Stuck, which is a book by a woman who, who advised Goldman Sachs as well as the US government around how often it's the loudest person in the room who, who speaks, which is a real issue often for women, let alone women of um, Asian background or people of Asian background for the cultural differences. Um, and she was quiet, she was softly spoken, so everybody had to be quiet. And she just brought such a different perspective to everything. It made us all sit back and pull ourselves up. 
even if ultimately a decision was made that was similar to what the, if you like, the group think was going towards, she made us really think differently. And to me, when I look at um, what happened with the GFC, I, br I bring that back as just a, exactly. you know, different thinkers in the room who weren't listened to. I mean, gosh, if that wasn't a lesson, um, what was? Um, and so I think moral, I think um, eth ethical, I think um, uh, certainly in terms of uh, ec economics, I mean, it's, it's an absolute necessity now and we need to do it fast because the world's changing too quickly. So that's my personal view. Excellent. Hi, my name's Lucy and I work in corporate institutional banking. Um, in terms of setting targets, I think we've had um, examples of, of a myth in the company where, you know, in terms of gender, women, oh, the woman is going to get higher because she's a woman and there's a target. And I, we don't want to fall in the trap again of saying because she's, oh, he's an Asian, he's get higher for the role we want them to be higher because they're passionate and good at doing their job. What I really want to focus on is actually attraction of um, talent. Um, if we look at job descriptions, you'll see that on, on the bottom, in terms of requirements, you'll go graduate for particular roles, you should be graduated from certain um, degrees, and all these rules are sort of moving away from attracting diversity in teams. And I think these rules are there because it, that's how it's been previously done, and it's sort of the idea of if we to attract talent because of passion, because they really want to learn, it's like releasing control, saying that we're delving into the unknown rather than previously. We know that is sort of a model that worked. So how do you think companies that are big and complex like Westpac can, you know, get more comfortable with the hiring process like that? Hmm. Well, I think that's a great question. I think Leon almost touched on it earlier on because yeah, you're being very question. progressive. And you're thinking there. Well, well we've, certainly in, in my part of the business, we've changed um, how we brief our, our recruiters, our, our grad recruiters. Previously, they, we would go, look, bring us, um, you know, uh, in, uh, young people from top tier schools with certain grades um, and deem to be IT grads or business grads um, and, and accounting grads, right? And I'm, I'm so happy to be able to say this now. You know, a little while ago, I rebriefed my grad recruitment team and I said, bring me interior designers, bring me architects. Mm -hmm. Bring me people, lawyers, right? Bring me sociologists, bring me psychs, cog psychs. I don't care, just bring me people who are passionate and who want to learn and who are curious. The rest we can give them. I was actually gonna agree with all that because I, and this may go against what you think. I actually think there's a real crisis happening in our universities. I, well, there because is. I think that what, a, what uh, the product, if you like, that is coming out of universities now, if you look at the more um, uh, conservative degrees or the, 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 the traditional mainstream degrees are just not what we need mm -hmm. anymore. You know, I can't think, how many of you can really think about what you learned in university that you use much beyond about the first year or two year outside of uni? I mean, hardly anything. I mean, what we want is people who are adaptable, who are critical thinkers, who can influence outcomes, who are good communicators, who can work in groups. Critical thinking and they might have, they might have, but who can work in a team um, and who see that, that, you know, so much of what you work, you learn as you're going on and building your career, 80 or 90% of it's in the workplace. The rest of it might be sort of some formal education, but I just see that as so important. So when I think about it, Catherine Livingston now talking about, May, who's about to become the Chancellor of UTS. Well, maybe we should have degrees where you're two years in the, in, in the university and then a year in a workplace and then maybe another year at a university and sort of finish it off that way. Um, I, think, I think we've got to really think and shake the whole university system up. Mm. And, and to your point, actually, probably say, stop saying we only want people who've got an economics degree or an accounting degree or whatever, because they're not necessarily the people who are going to be the right thinkers for the fourth industrial revolution we're going through now. I think it's a great point. It's all about thinking out of box, out, outside the box. That's right. Don't we? And, and I think one one of the, the a, while I don't agree all of your points, <laughs> but the fact that yes, there, there's there, there is a disconnect between our education system to what's really happening on the ground. Um, the, the researchers they have a, a certain way of thinking, and they are taught um, to think that way, and it, it's. It's it becoming an un incompatible to what the real world 
is and how we how we operate in the real world. Um, so it certainly it's very important for the researchers to, to realize and the number of researchers I've spoken to about what are they using their researchers for. Do they just put it on the shelf and tick the boxes or do they actually make, making use of that to, to benefit the society? You'll be surprised at how many scholars don't think that way that, and they, uh, the, the, there's one from, from, from India he said he had this fantastic, he was presenting this fantastic um, research he's done about the, the rural community moving into to urban community. And my question was, what are your strategies to, to, for the policy makers to adapt, adopt these research into their policies? <coughs> and he said, I had never thought of that way. So mm. and many, many researchers don't think that way, ha they don't think um, to link their researchers to real life. So that's certainly some, some a, a mm. very mm. important area that the, mm. the institutions mm. need to look at. Mm. I'd say a couple of, uh, I'd say a couple of things about that. Oh, sorry, you, you come and speak first. <coughs> well, I'll, I'll, while you're coming out, I'll just say, in, in terms of tokenism, tokenism gets a bit of a bad rap. But I can tell you, I've been one of Australia's most Benefic greatest beneficiaries of tokenism, put on places because I was seen as a change agent to change the system. And people might think I'm a token, but after the first meeting they'll know I'm not. All I wanted was somebody to open a door and get to sit at the table. And I knew that I had to, like any first of a kind, you know that you have to really deliver got to talk about the needs of your constituency, so you've got to be informed about them, you've got to research it, and you've got to be able to think about it. And when people, whether it's Gail being the first mm. MD, mm. the expectations of mm. first of kind, mm. you know, are, high, are very high. Mm. So when you say tokenism as though there's something wrong with it, actually there's a lot right with it, mm. because it does enable people to be able to, to take the lead and it takes me to the next point too, that we shouldn't be frightened of failure. Just because someone gets it wrong, doesn't mean that the idea is wrong. Every idea has its time. So I do think that you just need, we just need to keep on remembering that that's important. When Tom was the CEO of, of Citigroup, he was an Irish American man. It's the loveliest story, I think. He, he called me in and he said, I read something you wrote in a paper about why there are no women in the boardroom, like this is 1986, or 90, no, no, 95, sorry. And he said, look, I've just come from Taiwan and I had a general, I had 13 reports as the managing director of city in Taiwan. And he said there were seven women and six men and they came from eight different cultural backgrounds. He said, in Sydney here, I've got Sydney University Economics Department Football Club. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always stayed with me, that metaphor. It's about the top school, mm. the economics mm. department from mm. Sydney University, mm. rugby, mm. despite the fact that the rest of the world plays soccer and <laughs> AFL and <laughs> other things. But why is that still what we bow to in terms of it? It's mm. about clubbiness. Mm. Anyway, mm. your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Peng. Uh, I'm from uh, Premium Westpac Premium. Um, we have a team of uh, we have a team in Melbourne and team in Sydney. Uh, total about over uh, nearly thirty Asian speaking managers, relationship managers. Um, so um, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Asian state general managers this year. So I guess the 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 reason I want to come up here is I, I got quite excited about tonight's topic about Asian leadership uh, and also uh, diversity and inclusion um, because uh, this is quite new to me. Um, I think 2016 is uh, really a year that um, I've seen things happening. Um, um, and uh, just uh, we have uh, most of our teams here tonight. Um, and my question is uh, I, I, s I can see lots of tenants uh, and lots of colleagues here uh, faces are recognized and many Asian uh, tenants here. And when we talk about this topic, I guess my question is, uh, um, 
we talk about how do we, because uh, Asian people, we, uh, um, we, most of us are just for the cultural reason, don't we, we, we quiet, we don't, we don't speak up, um, and we just, we, we are very good uh, staffs, mm -hmm. we can do a lot of things, we, we work really hard. Um, so, um, but I, I really want to see people here, uh, lots of uh, everyone here, that uh, for people who has um, uh, the desire to, to step up as a leadership, uh, to actually to really make influence to, to uh, uh, because as, as some of the presenters said, we have a big Asian population, and uh, we do have uh, lots of business from Asian countries, especially China. Uh, so f for us to actually step up to make a difference to society, uh, to our people, to our community, um, and and to um, uh, to the world, you know. Um, so if I can get one advice from one presenter here about um, how you know you think an Asian uh, can um, you know uh, perhaps um, you know uh, try you know if they really want to step up as leadership, um, uh, for example. If someone wants to become the first Asian CEO, I'm not a Ken <laughs> Young. Uh, then, uh, how 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 do you see that uh, how they long can? Has he got? Okay, <laughs> that's my question. Five Thank you. Years? Ready in five. <laughs> okay, I think that's a really important thing. Finding your voice when you know, in my generation, girls were told not to be bold. Boldness was the worst thing, because you don't get far in the world if you don't can't make a few bold strokes. Mm -hmm. Don't speak unless you're spoken to. Wait till we ask to dance. You know, everything in your life was about waiting for the invitation to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And in some cultures, that's a very important part still for women. You know, I see it everywhere with women, mm -hmm. young women. They might be loud with their, their little peer groups. But in fact, when they're in their parents' homes or in their in, in other social situations, they're discouraged from using their voice. And, and that stays with you a very long time. And in certain cultures, when I've taught Chinese children in the US, they were just totally bemused by the outspoken brash Americans mm. who were running political campaigns um, for around president, presidential elections. And these young people were just looking at, in amazement at the at, at the use of voice. Mm. So voice is a very important thing in terms of how we manage diversity. Why did you decide to support Dawn? <coughs> Why did I decide mm. to support Dawn? Westbank. Because Why did they decide to support well, Dawn? Because very good decision, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because we have a very diverse workplace. Yeah. We need to see more leadership um, of our diverse workplace. Um, and we have a, a, a growing international business. Um, and so for us to be successful in a, a globally interconnected world, to make our staff feel included and feel comfortable and safe in this environment, we absolutely need to have, um, you know, uh, the, the dawn, um, uh, you know, thinking going on, now EAG that we have going, absolutely necessary. Um, and so it's, it's to start the conversation. These are really important events. Mm. It's to start the conversation, to get the issues out on the table, to sensitise people to what these issues are. I mean, the fact is the Australian banks are not very um, diverse. diverse. <laughs> so I had the same experience as, you know, I came from City, which it didn't have many women in leadership or cultural people, but it actually had a cultural, a, quite a cultural makeup that's quite different Ab to the Australian absolutely. banks. More than any other so more bank than in More than any other bank in Australia, a big cultural makeup. So the big shock to me was in 1997, after I'd spent seven years at City and I went and joined CBA, I just was like looking around. Like, hey, where are, first of all, where are all the people from different countries? Yep. And where are all the women? Like, not, and this is, CBA is a lot better by the way now, but it was just such a shock to me about what an Aussie, mm place it was and so we've got a long way to go and the connection with the international world it was, was not a project in city it was no. everyday life it was everyday it? life yeah. everyday life it was connected yeah. and and you had this set of people that moved all around the world working in different yeah. branches for city so they had that big global outlook so it was easy for somebody to say when you say well the growth in china's going on and we, we think about this for somebody to say oh yeah yeah you should see you know this is happening and that's happening and when i was up there a few weeks ago i noticed it, it, 
this and that, but you've got to understand culturally this will never happen or that will never mm. happen. It's, you know, it's getting that discussion going. How are we ever going to work out what's going on in the world um, if we don't have that sort of, uh, you know, voice at the table? So it's, it's, in, it's critical to us. Don's giving me the wind up. <coughs> so mm. is there anyone here who's d just longing to say something and will feel so disappointed? Yes? Come out, come out the front. And if you don't get a chance, excellent. Um, so I guess, uh, so, sorry guys, uh, my name is uh, Danielle. Uh, I'm working for New South Wales, the business chamber as a China trade advisor. Uh, I guess like uh, since I was a very young, I'm always uh, very inspired by uh, women and men like yourself and be you know, really confident and then getting to the stage that at a leadership sort of um, stage and then, um, and then, you know, and telling people and then and, and speak about things and then just that kind of confidence. And I guess um, out of the career, I guess the family also plays a very um, big role in life. Um, just still want to know, like, uh, as a really successful woman and a man, um, how does the family uh, play in a role in your life that... Uh, to support you along the way and uh, getting to where you are now, being able to sit here very confident and then, you know, spread out all this um, very positive energy to um, the rest of the world. Um, and also, um, is it a, something that you made a, like some kind of deci decision at a very early stage? Um, what kind of a family or partnership that I'm looking for so that I can not only achieve my personal and career goal, but also have a you know nice family and, and, and great kids. And how do you balance everything? And this is something I'm always <laughs> really curious. Be the next hour of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a long question. That's right. <laughs> well, Leon, you've got adventurous children in a yeah. In a you know, so I'm so proud. I I live uh, in a matriarchy. My grandmother, who is 87 still determines what schools her great-grandchildren go to. Oh, I love that. <laughs> you know, she lived through the Second World War and, and, and the occupation of Singapore, uh, where I'm from. And just, just the other week, I, I speak to her every weekend, and she's like, so where are you, what school are you sending the, the boys to? I'm like, oh, I don't know. She said, well, whatever you choose, before you make a decision, I want to read about those schools. So make sure you send them. <laughs> but, but so much of what I've learned comes from her wisdom, mm -hmm. and that's what I pass on to my kids. And, and the one thing that has stood me in, in amazing stead all my life and, and actually forms a big part of, of who I am today and, and my success today is she said one thing many, many years ago. She said, if you look after the people, the people will look after you. Mm. And she, you know, so powerful because end of the day, we're businesses and we're companies and we do products and services, blah, 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 but end of the day, we're all human. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And if you look mm. after people, Chances are they will then mm. return it. Mm. And I think it's a, mm. a beautiful philosophy. Mm. Mm. I, I would say I've been married for 51 years and I have three children and nine grandchildren. And I, I would say that you keep your, uh, the, the biggest, the best piece of advice I ever give to anyone, I think, is keep your head and heart connected. Mm. It deals with ethics and what's the right thing to do. If your brain's telling you something but your gut is saying no, so I knew even as a young woman that there'd be men I'd go out with, young men I'd go out with, but I knew when I married I wanted to have a long partnership. I just mm. instinctively knew that. And so my, my, you know, my brain was part of it and I've never let anyone push my family in the background. And I'm mm. always going to say they come first. Mm. And it's not dramatic because they're first in my brain anyway, but it doesn't mean that I don't go to work and do all the things and I'm a working grandmother, but it does mean that people know what you stand for and they know how much you'll stand for. And that really matters in the workplace mm. in terms of your family. And your family loves that about you, even when they hate what you do. Mm. But it does, you know, it's kind mm. of fits right. Kathy, what about you? They find a good man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, at one point I agree with you. This, it's what, what you have set out to do. If you, you set out to have a life partner and you commit to that, 
and, and that will reap rewards for you. I've been married for 28 years and I've got two boys. Um, can I just address that, that your, your question and also the previous question about the, the different cultural background? I think for, for me the importance to articulate it because we are in a, in a culturally fluid environment. So what we need to be, uh, it's a self-assessment, a self-awareness. So being aware of what environment you're in and so not to bring that cultural construct or social construct into a, a environment that doesn't understand that construct. So um, for, for, the, for the Asian uh, girls here, that you, you do need to be aware that, that the, the differences between the Anglo culture, where it's transparency and, and everything's in clearly marked boxes and, and clearly uh, set out boundaries, that we from the Chinese background, well I am from Chinese background, where we are or based in, in, in more of emotions. It's not all about re relational uh, obligations and, and the implications. So the difference for us is what we are aware. If, so it's quite safe for us if we are in that construct where everything's transparent and you know, in clear boxes. And it's uh, safe to speak up. Yep. So yep. it's knowing that differences and art articulate mm. it is your key. Mm. And I, I would just add to that that Kathy's doing some really interesting work with ageing people in, I'm really interested in ageing people at the moment, but, <laughs> and, and looking at the cultural differences in health situations about how they're treated. Mm. 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 And that's very, very important to your dignity mm. later mm. in life. Mm. And some, that's how I first met her. When this, um, and just finding out the work, looking at the work that she's doing and, and making a decision to try and make sure those people were, the people who cared for them were culturally aware. Mm. Mm. Lena, what would you like to say? Um, well, in terms of trying to juggle everything yeah. and have everything <laughs> around, um, so I would say a good man helps too. I've yes. been married yeah. for uh, 29 years. I have a, a almost 20 year old son and an almost 18 year old daughter um, who are a great joy to us. Well. Anybody who has teenagers, from time to time, they're a great <laughs> joy. They're cer certainly lovely kids. Um, I think. I think actually, also, I've, I've got a wonderful mother. I've got a wonderful mother who, at various times, has said to me, "What do you mean you can't do it? Of course you can do it. Go." And that <laughs> might have been at times when I had, you know, tiny, uh, tiny kids, or I That's had. That's why you're a wonderful it, mother because you've got, you've inherited that. Caring mm. and understanding mm. and risk-taking sense, yeah. Well, I hope so. And I, in a mum at various times would say, why would you say no to that? I'll help you out. Just go off and do it. And this was a woman who was working herself, you know. So a huge encouragement to me and, of course, a husband who's incredibly supportive of what I do. Um, but also, too, I just love uh, I just love working <laughs> around people. I love seeing people around me grow. I love giving back. That's, to me, the giving back is, is seeing people grow and flourish in organisations and in their own lives. And it's a constant juggling act. You know, your life goes, people think, oh, in that period of time, so long as I get a bit of help and can work part-time, everything will be fine. Well, guess what? Life changes. Things happen to you at all various points of time. The important thing is to be around people that understand you, that care for you, um, and that are going to support you at the times that are different and that you need it. Um, and, and be in organisations that are like that. And, and I, I feel very fortunate that I think Westpac's uh, one, yeah. of those, one of those such organisations. So okay. it's, it's a balance. Here? Sorry. You're right. Thank you. Thanks for that lovely question. Yeah, it's very nice. Would I didn't have a question. I had I, an answer. Oh, good. Oh, Go. Excellent. Great. <laughs> um, I'm going to switch it here. I'm Rajesh and I work for Westpac in the business school. Um, for Daniela's question, choosing a partner who is actually a true partner in every aspect and choosing well, actually helps you to both emotionally be as a woman mm. in the workplace. Mm. And she mentioned, don't lead before you're ready to lead. Yep. Mm. So even if you're thinking about family and mm. stuff, progressing towards having one, don't stop the clock before you reach the position there. So the idea is, you know, that she needs to persevere. Because just having a pregnancy and having a baby shouldn't stop you from achieving your goals and, and mm. achieving mm. what you want to mm. in life. Mm. 
good, good, great answer. That's a lovely note, I think, to end on. And I want to, let, um, to ask Di to come up here now and do the final wrap. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you so much to the panel. Thank you, uh, first of all, I don't know, I sat there and I think I'm sure we can continue this conversation and um, I'm sure you can take this offline. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, very much uh, Jung for, um, I think, at the end of last year when I discovered that he became the chairman of the Asian Leadership EAG, I went straight away and, <laughs> and contacted him and said, listen, I've been trying to get this, um, and we've had this series of leadership conversation with the St. James Ethics Centre, with Ashurst, with Bacon McKenzie last year. And I said, and I've had a conversation for the last 12 months with various uh, leaders in, in Westpac, and Jung and I just connected, and, and we believe so much in terms of the need to see an increase in uh, diversity and leadership representation across our mainstream institutions. And Westpac, I think, uh, has about 21% of staff are of Asian heritage. I think that's including South Asian as well. Um, and I believe, and, and we talk about how, you know, how come we don't see more of these um, uh, individuals at a leadership level. And, and I presented this idea to, uh, uh, to Jung, who came to one of our conversations, and he said, being the chair, there are three pillars, and I, he, you heard how he, he explained the three pillars that he wants to drive through, through the EAG. And um, so we started this, this series. So uh, I'd like to first of all thank Q Jung for believing in it, uh, Jenny Lam, his team, and, and the EAG team for working with uh, the Dawn team. Uh, and I would love to uh, thank the, the Dawn team, there's Sally, uh, and there's Katie, there's Melinda, uh, there's a team of social media. These are all volunteers that have got the full-time work but they believe in this so much that they're giving me time to drive this conversation. And we're doing this all of our own time. So I'm really grateful for your contribution. But I would particularly like to thank Lynn, Lynn, for actually supporting this initiative that Jung has brought to you. <laughs> I think in every organisation you need to see a senior executive and a chief executive such as Lynn's level to see the need to drive this. And it takes, it's not just from the top, but it's also take from the bottom up to go up as well, that you need to ask for it, you need to demand for it. And, and I think that this is a first step in, a, in, in many to come that uh, I think Westpac has taken the initiative to really put it out there and get everybody to start thinking about leadership and what it means for you and what it means for the organisation and what it means, I think, um, for our uh, society. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, my dear, I call her Auntie uh, 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 Wendy, and uh, as, as Wendy said, you know, I've, I've come to her, she's like my, my, my mentor over the years, I've come to her at every crisis point and ask her. <laughs> um, but uh, I think mentoring is very, very important, and I hope that, that through uh, what we're going to do, we're going to establish a mentoring system that we can offer. Um, and um, thank you, Leon. Leon, we only met just a few, a few weeks ago. We met and we just click, and mm -hmm. we just thought, my God, you know, we share the same passion in driving diversity and inclusion. And I thought, this man, that's it. The next thing is, I'm going to go to Deloitte too, and, and and be part of that that change there. And Kathy, through Wendy, I met, who's very passionate about diversity and inclusion, and uh, and so fun fantastic to listen to all of these. Um, and I've learned so much tonight as well, and um, and I hope that you have too. So Dawn, as to briefly, as you know, is about growing culturally diverse leadership, and that's what we're about. And we're hoping to drive this conversation not just in Westpac, but throughout all the other organisations, as well as in the political and mainstream media. And um, and uh, we have got an emerging leaders development program, which is um, you probably got a pamphlet there on your chair, which we have developed specifically to target um, people of culturally diverse background, but in particular Asian and South Asian. And the workshop uh, is, I think a couple of, of um, uh, 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 Westpac staff have, have tested this and it's really great. So that's at the end of uh, April, so um, you can go and see Katie, one of our Dawn member, Katie over there, and register your name and, and interest and talk more about it if you want, or and put your name name down as well too for Dawn. Um, and our next Asian Australian leadership conversation will be around politics. 
uh, because with the upcoming uh, political uh, election in July, we thought it's a good time to talk talk about political representation. So we will keep you posted about that, and um, and uh, hopefully that you you can share that. So I really encourage you to also sign up, you know, to support Dawn and grow it, and and to uh, uh, to ex um, answer Pang, who talk about leadership. Uh, what can you do to really, you know, um, improve your co improve your presentation or maybe build your confidence or capability? I believe through Dawn we will slowly develop programs that will target that and harness that. And I really encourage you to, you know, come and talk to me and to our Dawn team because it, it does. Uh, the quietness, um, it's good, it's quiet, but you can also actually learn how to use it more effectively and there are ways to do that. Um, so it's time to think about how you can play and be a leader within your organisation and how to step up, uh, encourage you to step up because it's the, the system can only find you if you put your hands up. Um, and um, unfortunately, you know, you need to do that. You need to think about it. You know, approach somebody in your senior in your organisation and talk about it. Um, so on that note, I would I'm really thankful for um, Westpac support partnership. Uh, we will hopefully announce that uh, in due course, uh, Jung. And thank you for coming tonight on a Wednesday night to be part of this. And I hope you found that stimulating. And I hope that we will continue this conversation. So thank you. Thank you for the catering. Thank you for your support. Mm. Thank you. Thank you.